as basic as this sounds, this is actually a very, very important aspect of medicine. And it's an art. You have to perfect it. Wherever you go, whether you're in the emergency department, whether you're on the ward, whether you're seeing patients in clinic, a good history is always the first step to a proper evaluation. It's always a first step to a proper diagnosis. Without a history, you pop, you're pretty much are stuck and you may not know what exactly is going on with the patient. Grab a piece of paper. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at history taking, particularly in internal medicine. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend. We are doing medical lectures on the channel. So remember that history taking is actually quite immense. It's fascinating. It's a skill that you learn and you keep perfecting it. Unlike with physical examination where your skills actually reach a plateau of you being able to pick up certain clinical signs, the art of history taking actually gets better and better with time. And as you see more patients, as you're exposed to more patients, you sharpen your clinical skills and how to take an efficient history. And remember that history taking is an art that has to be mastered for you to be able to reach a correct diagnosis. 90% of the time, the answer is in the history. 10% of the time, you will need additional things such as the physical examination findings and the investigations to help you figure out the answer. But remember, most of the times, the answer is in the history. So what's the sequence of history taking? I don't want to take much time in this video. I always say this and then end up making a 30-minute video, but I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. So we'll start off with our demographics. We'll look at the name, the age, the gender, the residence, the religion, the marital status, the presenting complaints or complaining. What are they complaining of? I'm sure you have seen CO in some of the files. That's what it stands for. History of presenting complaints. This is where you develop the history, which is HX. HX stands for history, PC, presenting complaints. Review of system or ROS. Past medical history, past surgical history, drug history, as well as allergies, specifically to drugs and other allergies to other things. Family history, social economic history, then you give a summary of your history. So that's the sequence in which we're going to follow. In some cases, especially women of reproductive age or just generally women, we also do add an obstetric and gynecological history. If you're dealing with infants, we also do add a birth history, immunization history, uh, nutritional history and developmental history. That's with the pediatric population that may come in with other problems or end up in the emergency department in adult. But... This is strictly for adults. I covered the pediatric aspect in another video that I will leave tagged at the end. So we'll start with the demographics. So the first thing that you must always look at is look for the referral letter. I know there is sometimes a lot of stuff that's being referred from different clinics. And look at the referral letter. Why was this patient referred to you? What was done for this patient before the referral? And what is the diagnosis that this patient is being referred to? Because this will give you an idea of the different types of questions you're going to ask this patient. But of course, do not depend on the knowledge from the referral center because trust in your own history taking skills, trust in your own knowledge. So you want to collect your demographics data, including the name of the patient, which will obviously be done by you from the nurses or done for you rather by the nurses, the age of the patient, the gender is rather obvious. I think I'll be offended if someone asked me if I'm male or female, unless if I maybe looked ambiguous. Then of course the residence, the religion, the tribe, and the marital status. It's very important to ask about the age because certain diseases are very common at a certain age group. For example, if you get an older individual with features of malignancy, it's most likely a malignancy as opposed to someone who's younger with similar symptoms. For example, someone comes in with lower GIT bleeding. If they're younger, you would suspect maybe this is hemorrhoids. If they're much older, you would suspect that maybe this is a malignancy. Then, of course, the residents, some um, conditions are particular to certain places. For example, if a patient comes from the eastern province and they're presenting with clinical features such as jaundice, right upper cord in pain, 
And one of the differentials would be, of course, hepatocellular carcinoma because the, the, of the way groundnuts are stored in that area. They may contain these aflatoxins that are produced by aspergillus, and these toxins can actually precipitate the hepatocellular carcinoma. Additionally, sickle cell patients are more common from the northern, the Luapula province, i.e. the Bembers. Then... Most patients that actually have BPH are coming from the southern province because of the herbal medications that they use to uh, perpetuate or enhance their sexual activity because of the polygamous marriage practices that they have in the southern province. So those things will also help you understand. And of course, the residents, if they traveled outside Lusaka, we know that outside Lusaka, we don't really have malaria. Religion is very important because some religions, I'm not going to mention anything here, do not warrant their believers to get a blood transfusion that's for religious purposes. So that's why it's very important to ask these things. Then don't forget to indicate whether this was a hospital referral, a soft referral, and the date and time this history was taken, and also the place where this was taken, because often I see a lot of people not including when they're taking this history, the date, and where they're taking this history from. All those things are very important because these are legal documents. And remember that the patient should be informed of what you're doing. All the time when you see the patients, make sure that you inform them of exactly what you're doing because patients tend to get anxious. Patients tend to complain that you're just doing investigations. I don't even know what I'm being treated for. So you're, you want to pretty much give them a, a statement in, in the following lines. Like before we discuss what has brought you here today. I want to ask you a few background questions, your name, your age, or just to confirm. Sometimes you may be writing information in a file thinking that it's the right patient, but you're writing information in a wrong file. And those also have different implications. Then we'll come to the history of presenting complaints. So you can actually open this up to the patient and ask them, tell me what has led you to come here or what has brought you to the hospital. Do not ask for a diagnosis as in what's wrong with you or what do you think it may be? Because the patient will tell you, no, I'm feeling malaria. But you can't write that as a presenting complaint. Well, I'm feeling like as if I have COVID. You can't write that as a presenting complaint. You have to tell them, what do you actually feel? So this is actually the chance that the patient is going to be given to actually avoid any prejudice and they'll be able to open up. At this stage, if you have already gotten the demographics out of the way and you've calmed the patient down, they're, they're beginning to build some trust in you and in your capability. So you should also try to understand the mood of the patient. Some patients will actually be quite anxious. Some patients will actually give you vague answers. Some patients may actually give you very brief answers and not open up so much. Some people may actually even be upset. So if you have done anything to upset the patient, for example, you took long to see the patient or the patient has been waiting in line, apologize to them and smile. Be friendly to them, not too over-friendly because some people may also be kind of irritated with that. So the complaints are going to be recorded in chronological order. So this should be recorded in the patient's words. And you should take them along a timeline. So what do I mean by along a timeline? So they should be either the most recent symptoms first, followed by the furthest symptoms, or the further symptoms followed by the recent symptoms. And do not forget to add duration. So for example, if someone has a cough for two weeks, this is for two weeks, this is how you represent two weeks. And there's particular notation for representation of certain things. One out of seven represents one day. So there's seven days in a week. Two out of 52 represents two weeks. There are 52 weeks in a year. Then four out of 12 represents four months because there are 12 months in a year. So I really hope you understand this timeline and duration and this notation that we actually use. So when you take the history along a timeline, you're able to build up information and give a much better picture of the patient's problem and how it developed from the time they were well to the time when they are fallen ill and possibly to when complications have developed. Then we come to the history of presenting complaints. This is like a story that develops on the symptoms that the patient has presented with. So you're going to be using the patient's words as much as possible. If the patient actually gives you some medical terminology, make sure that you confirm that medical terminology and ask them to explain what exactly they mean. Because sometimes they may be referring to lightheadedness when in fact they're talking about vertigo. They may be referring to easy fatigability when in fact they're talking about shortness of breath. So make sure that you do confirm these things. But if they do use these terms, put them in inverted commas, like, for example, angina or orthopnea, or, for example, chest pain. When the patient says chest pain and they don't use angina, then use chest pain and put it in inverted commas. Then begin with the earliest symptom related to the chief complaint and then pro proceed chronologically. So here's an example of a history that 
was taken in a patient. So the patient described the chest pain when walking up a hill four weeks ago. This resolved with rest and recurred with activity. Eventually, the chest pain subsided and the patient began to experience shortness of breath when walking short distances. One week ago, the patient began to notice that they were short of breath when lying flat and began having swelling of his legs. The patient, however, denied having to wake up at night to catch a breath. So that's how I'm developing my history such that when someone was to read this, they're giving a clear picture that this patient could be actually progressing towards heart failure. So you're going to be asking the patient to explain the illness in detail. So the mode of onset, whether it was an acute thing, a subacute thing or insidious or a gradual thing, the duration of the illness, whether the disease has progressed or remained the same, any associated symptoms, any aggravating and relieving factors, and of course, positive history to rule out involvement of other symptoms. Now, how do we actually develop this history of presenting complaints? So we figure out which system is being affected. For example, a patient comes in with cough, so we know that cough could be as a result of the respiratory system or the cardiovascular system. So you would ask questions in relation to the cardiovascular system, you would ask questions in relation to the respiratory system in the history of presenting complaints. I will talk about the questions that you're going to be asking, just be patient. Then in addition to this, if the patient has any pain, do not forget to ask about Socrates, the site, the onset, the character, the radiation, alleviating factors the time, timing and the exacerbating factors as well as the associated symptoms. So the history of presenting complaint must actually exhaust all the possible symptoms of the presenting system. For example, if a patient is, presents with diarrhea for two days, then the history of presenting complaints must focus on the gastrointestinal system. So this is actually where your English writing skills are very, very important. Then you come to the review of system because this is done in a systematic way from head to toe. The CNS, the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, GIT, GUT, musculoskeletal system, and sometimes the endocrine system. So we should review all the history at each and every single time when you present a patient, especially as an intern. Only mention the important negatives and positives relating to the presenting complaints. So as a student, it's actually important to mention every single thing. For example... If you know that a patient has features or you think that a patient has, may have features of heart failure and they don't have orthopnea and they don't have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, those are very important things to mention on your history that the patient denies sleeping or having difficulties when laying flat or denies waking up at night to catch a breath. So if you don't know which system actually is relevant in the history of presenting complaint, it's better to include more information than it is to include less information. So remember that many systems actually do affect many different body parts, and this may not be actually apparent to the patient. For example, someone may be having difficulty passing urine. At the same time, they may have difficulties in breathing. They may think that the difficulty in passing urine is not a significant thing. Meanwhile, it may actually be a significant thing because this patient could have a prostate cancer that may have metastasis ties to the lungs. So it's causing the difficulty in passing urine and it's also causing the difficulty in breath. So the patient is not going to be able to connect these things together. Another example is that a patient can actually be presenting with back pain and may have had even some hematuria from renal cell carcinoma that has spread to the back causing the pain. So for this reason, we actually have to assess each and every single system each and every single time we see the patient so that we perceive the problem as a as a whole and not really parts of the puzzle. And remember that when you're doing this, the patient may actually get irritated because they'll be wondering, why are you asking me about my stomach ache when I'm complaining about a headache? So make sure that you explain what you're going to do, that I'm going to ask you extra questions that are going to help you such that if there's any other thing that you've missed out in your history, you are able to pick that up because it may be related to the condition that you're going to be having. So here are the questions. So in the CNS, tremors and seizures, headaches, use the Socrates site, onset character, radiation, alleviating, timing, exacerbating, and associated symptoms. If they have any, any collapse, blackouts, or fainting, dizziness, or loss of balance, loss of the special senses, vision, speech, sight, taste, smell, or any memory loss, any features of paresthesia, tingling, pins and needles, any weakness or numbness in the arms and legs, pain in the limbs and the back, if there's any change in the sleep pattern and if they've been having any mood swings. But of course, this would be a subjective thing and not really an objective thing, unless if maybe you have someone else who has noticed this. Then we come to the respiratory system, as if they do have a cough. If they do, is it with sputum or without sputum? If it is with sputum, how much sputum is produced? 
What's the frequency? What's the nature of the sputum? What's the color of the sputum? Is any pus in the sputum? If they are having any chest pain, what's the location? What's the nature? What is it worsened by chest movements? Don't forget the Socrates. Are they coughing out any blood, which is known as hemoptysis? Are they having any fever with chills and rigors, which is a sudden feeling of cold with shivering accompanied by a rise in temperature, often with copious sweating, especially at the height or the onset of the fever? Then ask also about constitutional symptoms of TB, so night sweats, weight loss, anorexia, uh, and hemoptysis, or, or cough. Then ask if they have any wheezing or noisy breathing that they can actually hear. In the cardiovascular system, ask about chest pain, the location, the character, the radiation to the neck, shoulders, or arm, any alleviating or exacerbating factors, shortness of breath. Is it in relation to exercise or is it at rest? And what's the amount of exertion that has to be put in for this person to become breathless? Do they have any paroxysm or nocturnal dyspnea, that's breathlessness at night that awakens them from sleep? And do they have any orthopnea, which is difficulty in breathing when they lay down flat? Are they having any palpitation, which is an undue and an unpleasant awareness of the heartbeat? A patient can feel their own heartbeat and it can be pounding. It's very different from tachycardia. Palpitations and tachycardia are not really synonymous. They may occur simultaneously. Tachycardia is just a fast heart rate. Palpitations is where the patient can actually feel. So it can actually be very fast. It can also be slow and painful. Then you may also have intermittent claudication where the pain is actually caused by the exertion and little blood flow is actually going especially to the calf muscles and this may actually cause pain in the calf muscles. In the GIT, abdominal pain, so we should use the Socrates as well, the nausea and vomiting. You should ask the color, the smell, the content, any blood and the frequency. The bowel patterns, does this patient open any bowels? If they have... Open bowels, is it loose stool? Do they have diarrhea? Is there blood in stool? If it's frank blood, is it hematochesia? If it's black, tarry stool, is, we call this melena. It's a feature of upper GI bleeding. Hematochesia is often a feature of lower GI bleeding. Ask if they have any constipation. If they do have constipation, ask them if they're passing flatus. Then ask for about dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, changes in appetite, an increase or a decrease, weight loss or weight gain, dyspepsia, which is the indigestion, the so-called gases, and ask if they've noticed any yellowing of the skin and the eyes, although this would be objectively determined by your physical examination. Then we come to the GUT, the genital urinary tract. Ask if there's any hematuria, blood in urine, nocturia, which is urinating at night, polyuria, an increase in the amount of urine produced, frequency, an increase in the number of times they're urinating. Note the difference between polyuria and frequency. Then dysuria, pain upon urination. Ask if they have any menstrual irregularities in the women, if they have any vaginal discharge. Of course, don't be a clerk and just be like a, a trained parrot that's just going to be following a schematic and you're asking a uh, man if they have vaginal discharge. Then if it's men, ask about your urethral discharge, any suprapubic pain or pain in the abdomen, if there's any dribbling of the urine, if there's any delay in urination, which we call urinary hesitance, if there's any changes in the color of the urine. Then in the musculoskeletal system, ask about joint pain, change in mobility, stiffness of the joints or difficulty walking, swelling of the joints, the back pain or rash or neck pain, ask if they have any skin rash. Then in the endocrine system, any swellings in the neck, any increase in sweating, intolerance to cold or hot weather, generalized weakness, fatigability, any mood swings, irritability, restlessness, any, any skin changes that you may have noted. Then if the other systems don't show any positive signs towards the presenting complaint, you can simply just write that the other systems were non-revealing. But make sure that you sometimes add these because some consultants are very particular and some other practitioners are very particular that you should actually add these things so that they know which questions you asked and which ones you didn't. Then a negative response is as good as a positive one. Do not forget this. This is a very underrated statement. The negative responses are as good as the positive ones. Then we come to the past medical history. So here, there's a peculiar logic or a particular logic that is used in the past medical history. So for many conditions that present to the doctor, there should be a distinction between the current problem and what has happened in the past. So sometimes it could be an acute exacerbation of a chronic illness. For example, someone has a chronic liver disease, they come in in acute decompensation or they have a chronic obstructive disease, they come in in acute exacerbation. So they have had this problem for years. So make sure you make this distinction. 
So it's quite important to ask if the patient has had similar conditions in the past and if they were treated. This gives you a history of whether this has been a chronic thing or it's an acute thing. Ask them for any past admissions. If they have been admitted, what were they admitted for? How long were they admitted? What treatment was given to them? Were they discharged or did they just leave against medical advice? Ask for history of similar illness, any chronic medical problems, and any history of blood transfusions. If they've had blood transfusions, how, how many blood transfusions have they had? Have they reacted to any blood transfusions? Then we also ask about areas of interest. So diabetes, epilepsy, asthma, TB, hypertension, HIV, and sickle cell, the mnemonic deaths. And remember, when you're asking about HIV, make sure that it's in a very private area and you don't ask it in front of many people or if you don't actually have privacy, you can wait until you examine the patient where you can actually ask everyone else to leave and then you can ask them if they have checked the status. That's a very good way to actually do it. So at this point, the patient may actually even may want to talk much more than the doctor. So you should actually guide the history and make sure that the patient doesn't go uh, off tangent. Then some people may give you a very clear and concise and chronological perfect history. Some people may not. Then for patients that... Uh, actually use this difficulty in giving you the history, you should make sure that you clarify as much as possible. So I ask them in the lines of, so you mean to tell me that this is what happened? Or can I go back to when this happened? Or can I check if I've understood? Then you pitch the history to them. Or so up to that point, you did this and that. So use those statements to actually guide the discussion and make sure that you confirm the details from the patient. Then we come to the past surgical history. If they've had any procedures, what is the indication? What was the procedure done? Any complications? You should include C-sections here for the female patients in the past reproductive history. Then we come to the past drug history. So the past medication that they were on, what medication has this patient taken for the condition or any other underlying conditions? Is the patient on treatment currently? What medication are they taking? What is the dosage? What is the frequency? What is the route of administration? So if possible, ask them to show you the packaging of the medication or the medication itself. Are they taking any alternative therapies like homeopathic and home remedies, Ayurvedic medication, traditional medication, any history of any allergies to drugs? Some people are allergic to sulfur-containing drugs like Fancida, Septrin, and penicillin-associated allergies. Ask also if they have allergies to foods, eggs, and other things. It's also very important to ask about the past immunization history wherever applicable, especially in children. Then you come to the obstetrics and gynecological history. This is strictly for the women. So the number of children and the modes of delivery, the age of menarche or menopause, the last menstrual period, if applicable, the regularity of the periods, if applicable, the amount and the nature of the flow, the use of contraceptives, especially if they're using oral contraceptives. Then you come to the family history, the number of siblings, the history of similar illness in the family members, because this could be a genetic thing. Ask for any major diseases in the family members, diabetes, epilepsy, asthma, TB, because this is a contact. And it should be someone that they stayed with for some time in the past two years. Then hypertension and sickle cell. Then, of course, if there's any family members that died and what was the cause of them dying. Then we come to the last bit, which is the socioeconomic history, where you look at the occupation. This is, of course, to rule out some occupational diseases. The lifestyle, is it a sedentary or hardworking lifestyle? Do they exercise? The social and functional status or the financial status, the living conditions, how many rooms do they have? What's the ventilation? What's the source of their water? Is it an indoor and outdoor toilet? What's their diet like? Is it, are they vegan or are they vegetarian or is it a mixed diet? Do they smoke? If they do smoke, what's the duration? What's the number of packets per day? What's the type of cigarettes? Is it tobacco or sometimes it's, it, it, that sniff stuff or sometimes are they chewing it? And do they drink alcohol? What's the quantity, the duration, the type of alcohol and do actually calculate the units. We'll talk about this when we look at alcohol and alcohol withdrawal. Then do they have any other drugs that they're taking? What's the social I mean, sexual history, the number of current partners or partners in the past month. Of course, do not ask this in a public thing. It should just be you and the patient. Then is there any history of recent travel? Then we come to the summary. So this is just one sentence that summarizes the important parts of the history. So it's going to be including the important information, the presenting complaints, a brief description of the history of presenting complaints, plus essential details from the review of system, the past medical history, the family and the social economic history. So for example, here's a, a good summary. This is DJ, a young male. We can even add the age sometimes, but if it's strictly speaking, academically speaking, we should use these 
vague terms. Then newly diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis by sputum, okay, we can call it sputum positive TB, who presented with a two weeks history of dyspnea with associated chest pain, fever, weight loss, night sweats, and a TB contact, retroviral disease negative. That's another thing that I have added because it's a significant negative in this patient. So in your summary, it's recommended that you do not use the name of the patient, so make sure that you use initials and use an estimated age range, though some physicians advocate to state the actual age. So those that are below 45, they are considered as young. Those that are 45 to 65, middle-aged, greater than 65, old age. Remember that a good summary is like a miniskirt. It is short, yet it covers all the essential parts. Then we come to the impressions and differentials or your assessments. So these are based on your history. So the impressions and differentials must be linked to your history. You should be able to defend them from your history. Why are you thinking this is disseminated TB? Then, of course, this section along with the summary is quite important when you're presenting the case as a student. However, as a junior resident medical officer in the patient files, that we actually don't even summarize patients. We only summarize them when we're actually reviewing the patients, of which is a different way in which we actually look at the review of the patients. I'll do a separate video on how we review patients each and every single day. So I really hope you understood this and you enjoyed this video. If you did, we will do some more case presentations on the channel. So please drop a like, drop a comment, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Do not forget to subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.